So we started this series of messages on uh, uh, getting past fear, and, um, which I was really afraid to tackle. <laughs> and, uh, it was Chris's idea. Okay, the whole thing was Chris's idea. He laid the thing out, decided what weeks he wanted to preach and what topics he had, and then um, I said, "Well, what do you have in mind for me on the first of May?" And he said, "Well, there's a, there's a couple of uh, things that I really don't want to tackle." <laughs> but they'd be really easy for you. <laughs> so, uh, I, don't, I don't know why I thought things were easy for me. Um, so we're going to talk about how to get past uh, being afraid of people finding out who we really are. Or, or being known. Which is not easy for me, by the way, okay? Uh, I've just had more years to feel frustrated about it. So um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, which by the way is one of those passages that I must have spent a lot of time in because this page just comes right out. <laughs> so, but I'm, I'm hanging in with it. I'm going to preach, just so you know, okay? I'll let you know. I'm gonna, here's my theory. I'm going to preach until this tape gives out. <laughs> the strips of tape that are holding the Bible together. When that goes, I go. That's it. <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians 6, we're going to look at, at uh, uh, several parts of it, but I want to begin by reading this. Uh, verse 11. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and we've opened wide our hearts to you. We're not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, that I'm speaking to you as my little children here, open wide your hearts also. So let's pray. Lord, teach us from this. How can we not be withholding and not be uh, inhibited, but that we could open our hearts uh, to one another and to you in a, in a whole new and fresh way? Give us the courage to live beyond our fear. That's, that's what we need today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, this uh, passage in 2 Corinthians is very uh, profound because um, as we've talked about many times, our culture, our city, uh, the places we work and shop and play put absolutely no value on authenticity. Now, they, they like the idea of authenticity. They're, they like the word, hey, we need to be authentic, right? That's, that's really great until you go to your performance review at your job and you sit down with your supervisor and say, you know, I just want to be real here with you. And uh, I'm a little afraid of this meeting because, you know, I'm way over my head at work and I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just picking up clues from the people around me as best I can and I hope I don't do any lasting damage to this company. <laughs> you know, frankly, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, Peter Principle, you get promoted up to the level of your total incompetence, and that's where you stay, which is why all the supervisors are totally incompetent. Um, they've risen. And um, I just want you to know that if you give me this promotion, I'm going to be way out of my league, and I won't know what I'm doing. I'll just be making stuff up. Just wanted to share authentically with you, as the preacher said we should. You know, How would that go? Not all that well, probably. Uh, even if you say, and I know our company really values being real and honest, it still wouldn't go well, right? And you know where it doesn't go well particularly? In church. How strange is that? Uh, anybody ever go to church before today? <laughs> Few of you, okay. I'll talk to you three. <laughs> Ignore all the visitors. <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah. so what happens is you go into church, and that is the last place that anybody's going to be real. That's the last place you want to be authentic. Uh, I mean, I was groomed in this at home. You know, we, we had to drive 25 minutes from Whittier into L.A. to go to church when I was a kid, and, and my dad was swatting over the seat the whole time, you know, and we're yelling and crying and everything, and then we pull up to Wilshire Presbyterian Church, and it's like, okay, wipe those tears away. You go in there, and you look like 
whatever happened in this car didn't happen. <laughs> you know, and, and then we're there with all the other kids who are doing the same thing. And, then, you know, and so we all had this conspiracy as kids to not let on what it's really like. And then that continued into adulthood. So as adults, we come into church and we're hoping that uh, nobody finds out who we really are. And, uh, and so, uh, and don't get me wrong, I totally want you all to be vulnerable. <laughs> I'm committed to that. I'm committed to this being a place where you share vulnerably. And if you're afraid to share with each other, just share with me and I'll keep your secrets until stewardship Sunday. And then I'll make eye contact in a meaningful way. You know, and you'll know that I know, you know. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. That's been the con of the church for centuries. You come to the priest for confession, not to receive the priest's confession, by the way, right? But to loan your confession to the priest who then will hold it for you. It's a, it's a quandary. Uh, years and years and years ago, before any of you were born, there was a fabulous little book. It had about 12 words in it, mostly pictures. Um, so that's why I liked it. And uh, uh, written by a Catholic priest. Um, uh, and it was called, Why Am I Afraid to Tell You Who I Am? John Powell, Father John Powell. Why am I afraid to tell you who I am? And I thought, oh, it gets to the end. You know what the answer was when we got to the end? Because if I tell you who I am and you don't like me, that's all I got. So maybe it's better to pretend I'm someone else. And then if you don't like me, you didn't really know me. So it doesn't hurt as much. So I'll just show you things I want you to see, and you can decide whether you like them or not, and I can go on without feeling hurt because you don't like me. That's brilliant. That was brilliant. And, uh, and I think that at the core of that is this fear that we have of being known. What would happen if people really knew us, warts and all, the whole deal? Chances are, they wouldn't like us. And so we look to people. This is a great strategy. It's been used in the church, I know, for hundreds of years. We look around to see what people want from us. You make eye contact, you know, to see, you know, I think does everyone want me to be this way or that way? And then you try and be that for them, right? And in, the, in doing that, we end up creating an atmosphere of phoniness, superficiality, pretense, all the while saying, oh, we got to be, we got to be authentic with, the, you know, here because the Lord's with us and we love each other and we don't even know each other. We just know these little pretend things that we put out there. Uh, I got good at doing uh, what I call faux vulnerability. Uh, it's like vulnerability, but different. It's like virtual vulnerability. It's, it's like vulnerability, but it's not really. And that is, I can think up a story from long ago, back when I lived in Africa, you know, and, and I can share that with you in a way that you go, wow, he's really shared, he's really opened up. Except that it's not something that I'm dealing with now. You know, so it's kind of like I'm uh, feeding pigeons in the park with y'all. I'm just throwing out stuff, breadcrumbs and things, and you're pecking around on the ground going, oh, isn't he being real? And it's not real because it's not the stuff I'm dealing with today. So if you don't like it, it doesn't really matter. That's the old me, right? That's why in church, people could give their testimonies, and it's usually things like, um, I used to be a terrible person. I was a mass murderer. I, uh, I got all drugged up and I, and I killed uh, 40 people and everything. But in prison, I met Jesus and now everything's great. You know, and you get on the circuit, you can go around to churches and give that testimony and write a book, you know. Everything's great. No one ever talks about, what are you dealing with now? Because that's, that's too personal. 
but we've all got a now that we're dealing with, right? We've all got a now. And if you don't, you will very soon. <laughs> it's coming. And so, if we're not going to look around and see what other people are doing, what's our option? Well, uh, in 2 Corinthians 6, Paul uh, writing just before the part about we've spoken freely to you, in chapter 4, he says, here's the basic thing. We're all like pottery. We're all with cracks in it. We're all crack pottery. Uh, of no value at all except for what's inside, which is Jesus. And he's alive in us and he loves us and he gives us value and meaning. What's on the outside doesn't really matter that much. So that's the beginning. And then he says here in chapter six, uh, we put uh, no stumbling block in anybody's path so that our ministry is not discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, in hardship, in distresses, in beatings, in imprisonments, in riots, and hard work, and sleepless nights, and hunger. That's how they commend themselves. Well, who wants to hear that? I had a, a pastor friend down at uh, Menlo, Menlo Park Presbyterian Church. He'd been there for years, and uh, we'd have lunch, and, and we'd sit down at lunch, and, and they'd say, John, how's it really going? Tell me only the good stuff. And, <laughs> and I'd just eat my salad, you know? <laughs> I don't know. And, until I got smart, and I went, and I told him this really horrible thing I was going through and the pain and the agony of it all. And he, and he got kind of concerned. He went, is that the good stuff? <laughs> and I went, well, the good stuff is that, you know, actually I'm still trusting God in the middle of it. And he went, oh, that is good. I hadn't thought of that. And uh, a few months later, we were visiting his church and he was out front shaking hands with people and saying, how's it going? Tell me only the good stuff. He didn't want to know how people were really doing it. So they're commending themselves in hardship, troubles, distresses, beating, riots, and brilliant. They're telling all the things that I would want to hide about myself. They're saying, this is what we're putting out there for you. So you would actually know us. Now, if we're not going to hide, if we're going to actually begin to courageously share our lives, How do we do it? How do we do it? Um, it's not just enough to go and kind of uh, emotionally vomit on the people next to you during the greeting time. Uh, how you been? Boah! You know, oh, no, back away. That's why I sit over in the back, you know, <laughs> a couple of rows distance, you know. And uh, I don't want anybody emotionally barfing on me. And uh, but. There is a way to do it, and it's over here, right after the riots, beatings, imprisonment, all that stuff, sleepless nights and hunger, what's he say? We're going through it in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love, in truthful speech, and in the power of God. That's how we're going to do it. It's, it's not that we hide away. We can be real about it, and we can... And we can begin to demonstrate that it's possible to trust God through the real stuff that we're going through, for the real pains and agonies and all that stuff. And we're going to do it truthfully, and we're going to do it with kindness and with love, and we're and we have the power of God. That's the only way we're getting through. And, and here's the deal. Seattle's a weird town, okay? Not like Mill Creek, you know, yeah, you people up there, you're different, you know. But Seattle folk, you know, <laughs> it's very strange because there's like this general rejection of Christians. And, and most of the people I meet have never been to church. You know, they, they had a cousin once who went once. <laughs> you know, that's about it. You know, usually at a wedding, I'm the one who has to sit next to that cousin, you know. But, um, <laughs> I believe that they've never met authentic Christians. So they've rejected the faith. They've rejected uh, the Lord. They've rejected the church. They've rejected Christianity based on all the phony Christians that they've met. What would happen if, uh, if, we, if we actually shared personally with people authentically in kindness and, and, and say, you know, I don't know if I'm going to get through this except for the 
God's power in my life. That's really about all I got to hold on to right now. I'm trusting Jesus, but no guarantees here. They might go, huh, well, that, that's something I might do. Maybe I can trust Jesus too in my situation. And mine's not that far afield from yours. And we could actually have a, a, a pretty fair uh, outreach. Most evangelism programs are based on giving quick answers, you know, or talking people into something. They're never based on authentically sharing. Isn't that weird? The one thing we have that could be transformational in people's lives and that the people around us would actually be interested in is the one thing we won't do. If we could just be honest and real and say, look, I'm trusting God in the middle of this. I don't know. In fact, maybe you're a pagan. Would you in your own way pray for me this week? Whoa, nobody's asked me to pray for him. I'm a pagan. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it would change everything. Now see, the problem is Paul goes through totally honest. I've been beaten, but they didn't kill me. I was sorrowful, but I was still rejoicing. I was poor, yet other people were getting rich. I had nothing, but I had everything. He goes through this whole list, and then he says, see, we, we've been sharing freely with you. We've opened ourselves up to you. We, we have totally held nothing back from you. But then what does he say? But you, we're not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. Now, I get that. Have you ever tried to be honest with somebody and they respond with the nice, appropriate, perfect answer? <laughs> like, you know, I, 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 we, we went on a little... Uh, anniversary getaway the last couple of weeks uh, we went down to the South Caribbean and it was mostly riding for me so I didn't get off the boat and uh, and Eileen's in a wheelchair so we pushing her around the islands in the sand is not that fun you know <laughs> but um, uh, so you're, there are all these people who have been around a long time and they have perfect lives when you're on a cruise ship everybody's life is perfect I mean, they're drinking so much that it's really perfect. And, uh, and so we met these people, and they were saying, you know, we've been married 45 years. And uh, honey, would you pass me that bottle? And, and we've been married 45 years, and we've never had a disagreement. Our marriage is so fine. And our children, let me tell you about our children. They're all perfect. You know, uh, honey, do you have a picture of that? My kid is an honor student, uh, a bumper sticker. Let's show them that. I want to see it. My kid's just getting out of the mental hospital. You know, but uh, could you show that picture? You know? <laughs> but I, was, I realized, we too, we were on our 45th anniversary. Just like them. It was our 45th anniversary. And I can't remember a day we didn't have a disagreement. <laughs> Not one. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, and then I realized, wow, well, it's too bad, you know, because for 45 years, they don't know each other. They have no idea who they're married to. They never had an honest talk below the surface. They don't even know their kids. That's probably the loneliest house on the block. Uh, what would happen if we actually, in spite of our fear of being known, went, okay, Let's do it. Let's just be real. In kindness and in love and, you know, all those things. Telling the truth. Not dumping loads on people or anything like that. What would happen? So I decided to do an experiment this year. And it's, it's going to sound weird, okay? So I apologize in advance if it sounds really weird. Uh, last year, today, May 1st, uh, I joined the Everett Golf and Country Club. Kind of an uppity club. It started in 1911, and they're real proud of that. And I didn't know any golfing members. I'd never played there before. Uh, Pam Prosky, part of our church, is a social member, so she said, well, I can try and get you in. Then she called me up and said, well, actually, the rules are that you have to have two respected golfing members 
who will sign an affidavit that they've known you for at least five years and they trust you and they know you and you're the kind of person that they would want to have in the club. <laughs> and I said, oh, I don't know anybody but you and you can't vouch for me. She said, well, I'll take care of you. So I get a letter saying, uh, come to the vetting committee meeting uh, that there have been two Long time respected members who have signed the affidavit about how much they know me and they respect me and they think I'm the kind of person they want to have with them in this club. So I go to the vetting committee meeting and I realize halfway through the meeting, two of the people that are interviewing me are the ones who signed the form saying how much they know me and we'd never met. <laughs> And I sat there and went, I can't wait to join this group. It's made up of liars. <laughs> and he just kind of looked at me and then approved me. <laughs> you know? and, I, and I do, this is a side thing. I'm going up a tributary here because I'm not on my riddle. But let me just say, um, the first day, it was, it was uh, May 1st last year, and I showed up to play golf and I was wearing a Hawaiian shirt. And the pro stopped me and said, sir, I'm sorry, you're going to have to change your shirt before you can play here. And I said, uh, no, the rules say you have to wear a shirt with a collar. And this has a collar. And he said, yes, but it's a Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> and I go, well, you know, in Hawaii, they just call it a shirt. <laughs> so... Anyway, so that's the kind of place it was. And uh, so for one year, I decided to do this radical experiment. What would happen at this uppity club where everybody's looking good if I just answered them honestly? Any question? So I did for a year. How's it going? Well, I'm really struggling right now, you know. Uh, my kid overdosed uh, yesterday, and we don't know, and things are problem. Wife's in a wheelchair, and I'm I'm emotionally uh, fragile right now. And I'm gonna, you know, play. <laughs> Would you mind holding it, Westfall, while, while I hit my shot? <laughs> so I just started being honest with them and uh, just answering their questions as as clear as I could without dumping a load. I'm you know, but just saying, you know, here's what, what I'm going through. At first, it was really weird, and then people started calling me up and asking if I could play, and I'd go out with them. And they would start in about the problem they're having with their kid who's been in and out of jail. And nobody in the club knows. And then this other, uh, so somebody's been struggling emotionally. One uh, very prominent member uh, said, uh, I, I heard you wrote a book. Somebody told me you wrote a book. I said, yeah. And it, well, my wife and I lost a child. <laughs> We've never gotten over that. <clears throat> Maybe we could talk. One after another after another. Uh, about two weeks ago, one of the uh, staff people came to me, young, handsome, scratch golfer, always happy, always positive. Uh, you know, I, I wanted to trade my life for his in a minute. <laughs> and he came and he said, somebody told me you wrote a book. I went, yeah, yeah. Get past what you'll never get over. And that's what I heard. Uh, I went, well, so? He goes, three months ago, my life ended. It just crashed. It burned. And I don't know what to do. Um, so that led us to start getting together and talking. And um, I realized that whole place is it's just like the church. <laughs> it's filled with people with issues. <laughs> I was going to go to the place where it was perfect because you guys have issues and I know that, okay? So I was going to go somewhere where people didn't have problems, where everybody's happy all the time, right? And they're always successful. And guess what I found? Issues. I found issues. I found people struggling in their life and not knowing what to do and uh, how to live or what the next step is or if they're going to make it or if they're going to come through. And, and, and they all want to know, how are you making it? How are you doing this? And all I can say is, well, you know, I'm trying to trust Jesus. I, 
I don't know. I'm not very good at it, you know, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to see if the Lord has something in, in, in mind for me and can help me get through this in some way, and I need some people around me to help encourage me to do that. They become a support group for me. It's the weirdest thing. Now, I'm not saying everybody has to go join the country club because, you know, I may not sign for you, you know. But, um, <laughs> but the thing is, if we are going to be real, if we're going to be authentic, if we're going to have a witness that matters in this world, it better be true. And the thing we can share with people is not how we've gotten our life together, but we can share how Jesus is holding us together while we're going through it. And there is power in that. You need to know that. There is total power in that. We've spoken frankly to you. Not with flowing words, not with big ideas, not with fancy talk, not glazing over issues. We've talked frankly with you. We've held nothing back. Please stop holding back from us. <clears throat> I spent most of my life with a decision that I would share with people as soon as they share with me. <laughs> you want to come and share a problem, then I'll reciprocate. I waited 65 years for people to start the ball rolling. You know, maybe Paul's right. It starts with us. We do it. Not because people are going to respond right, not because they're going to treat us well, not because of it, because they won't, but, uh, but because there's no other way to be healthy in your faith. There's no other way. You don't have to tell everybody, but you've got to tell somebody. And you've got to let yourself be known. And in doing that, you do the greatest ministry. You hand them a great, precious gift of your actual life. And say, I'm going to trust you with this. I'm handing it to you. So now you can know me, you can love me. I can love you. We can, we can actually care for each other.